wait, wait, wait. After spending a whole week in downtown Minneapolis walking around, I have that cadence, the timing, and the tone of voice memorized in that little ditty. My classmates from seminary and I attended the Festival of Homiletics this last week, where we got to listen to fantastic preaching all week long. The preaching took place in two different places simultaneously, and they were about six blocks apart. There was Central Lutheran Church and Westminster Presbyterian, and we walked back and forth between those two churches several times each day. We often found ourselves at one of the many crosswalks. And I noticed that people at the festival had a variety of responses to that command to wait, wait, wait. <laughs> there was my friend Peter, who crossed the street whenever he wanted to. His look told that signal, you can't tell me what to do. Then there was Ajawa, who outsmarted the signal by studying the timing and the traffic and deciding for herself when she would wait and when she would go. People like Sherry didn't seem to mind waiting. For her, it was the safest thing to do, even if there were no cars around for miles. How comfortable are you with waiting? Waiting is not one of my strong suits. I often find myself doing something like this. <laughs> because I don't wait for my food to cool down before I start eating it. <laughs> and not only do I dislike waiting, but I also like to make the most of my time, which leads me to do several things at once, not paying full attention to anything. Drive to work, listen to Bible study, watch TV, scroll through social media, wait in line, check my emails. I think that many of us will choose action over waiting any day. For instance, we know that it's polite to listen to people who are talking, but sometimes they just take a long time to get to the point. And you have figured out what they need to do in their first two sentences and they keep going. So you might want to jump in with your advice instead of waiting for them to finish. Can any of the couples out there relate to being on one side or the other of that situation? Yeah, it turns into a <laughs> raising hand. That wasn't Larry that raised his hand, was it? <laughs> Someone raises their hand. Yeah, it turns out to be frustrating for both people. And it's also a problem if you're on the game show, The Family Feud. Name a breed of dog, German Shepherd, that you could carry in a purse when it's fully grown. <laughs> you should have waited for the rest of the question. <laughs> but on a more serious note, maybe you know someone who has gone through some kind of a traumatic event and that person became really busy taking care of business, taking care of others, because if they were to pause or to wait a minute, they would start to feel some difficult emotions that they would rather push away. I had a friend one time who would call herself unlucky in love. She had a string of awful relationships, one after the other. And after one breakup, when I was sure that she'd jump quickly into the arms of a new person, I asked her, why do people who have been terribly unhappy in a relationship move so quickly into another relationship? Why not pause, take some time to figure things out, wait for the right person? I'll never forget what she said. She said, because no one wants to be alone with their demons. When you put it that way, it sounds pretty awful. 
wait, wait, wait. What are we waiting for? Let's see if our scriptures for today can shed any light on the subject of waiting. In our reading from Acts, the disciples find themselves first waiting for Jesus to drop back down from the sky. They are staring up into the clouds until two men in white robes ask them why. Now, I don't take the men in the robes to be saying, don't just stand there, do something. No, I think it might be more like, hey guys, it's going to be really obvious when Jesus comes back to earth again. Turn your attention to what's around you. Get your head out of the clouds because you're going to experience God in a totally new way. In the meantime, they were supposed to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promised Holy Spirit. Jesus promised that they would receive power to be witnesses when the Holy Spirit arrived. So that's where they went. The disciples, Mary, who was Jesus' mother, his brothers, and some other women. Now, I can imagine that it might have been just as difficult for them to wait as it is for us. They have witnessed the crucifixion and the resurrection and now the ascension. Emotions might have been running wild, a roller coaster between grief and joy and everything in between. Waiting together would give them time to sit with those emotions and sort them out. And Jesus had been appearing and teaching them for the last 40 days. Waiting would give the lessons some time to sink in. They've been told that the Spirit will give them power to witness. But the Romans were not favorable toward followers of Jesus. It was dangerous to be a Christian or a witness to Christ. I doubt they were feeling this power that Jesus spoke of because they needed to wait for the Holy Spirit to bring this power and to guide them. On a side note, if you read ahead in Acts, you'll find out that Peter may have grown impatient waiting for the Spirit. See, he said that they needed to replace Judas as a disciple. So he picked two men, and then they cast lots to decide which of the two would be the next disciple. That's like drawing straws or rock, paper, scissors in our day. And then a man named Matthias was the winner. But you never hear about him again in the whole rest of the Bible. I mean, who am I to judge? But I wonder if Peter acted too soon. Was Peter trying to keep busy or make the most of his time rather than wait upon the Lord? I'm just saying, Paul, who shows up later, wrote most of the New Testament. But back to our story. As a group, the disciples, Mary, the brothers, and the women were all together in a room. And they were praising God and constantly devoting themselves to prayer. They paused to pray. And isn't this what Jesus had been modeling for them and for us all along? Jesus found the power to resist temptations, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to preach blessings to the poor and woes to the rich, to defy politicians, to realign warped visions of God's kingdom, to have supper with sinners, to raise the dead, and even to die mercifully on the cross. But he accomplished none of that apart from prayerful communion with God. Likewise, those first apostles would accomplish nothing apart from prayer, and neither will we. Jesus knew what it was like to be human. He knew that there was danger in being alone with your demons, so to speak. So he called them and he calls us to be together with the saints instead. Because where two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, God is there. 
a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Those who wait upon the Lord will have their strength renewed. Those? Isn't that plural? Those of us together? What are we waiting for? We wait so that we become a community that listens to and responds to the leading of the Holy Spirit. So how might we wait, wait, wait upon the Lord this week? If you're wondering how this works, if perhaps you've only prayed by yourself or maybe not at all, I'm going to give you three ideas that you might try this week. The first one is, when you find yourself experiencing difficult emotions, instead of pushing them away or distracting yourself with a bunch of busyness, ask someone to pray with you. Share how you feel out loud to a caring Christian. I know receiving is hard for many of us who prefer to serve and to give, but I suspect that you will sense the Holy Spirit's power comforting and guiding both of you. Here's another idea. When you hear about someone who's going through a rough time, instead of just saying, I'll be praying for you, or typing an emoji of praying hands and clicking send, pause and pray. I mean actually pray. <laughs> How many times do we say we will do that and then we forget? Pray for the person with the person so that they can read or hear your actual words. The Holy Spirit's power may just turn your words into a healing balm. This is how Jesus prayed for the disciples in our reading from John today. He was praying to God, but he prayed out loud for the disciples and for us to hear those words so that we could be encouraged by hearing those words. And lastly, of course, we pray as a community here in worship. So keep showing up together with the saints to pause, to listen, and receive the Holy Spirit power to be witnesses to Christ. In the holy pauses, we pray so we can learn to listen to ourselves, to God, and to one another. A discerning community is one who listens with the heart and receives power from the Holy Spirit to respond in love. May we do just that.